All right, it's, uh, it's my pleasure to welcome Valerio Toledano Laredo of Northeastern University who will speak to us today about stability conditions and Stokes factors. Thank you very much, David. Uh, this is my first time at the Worldwide Center of Mathematics, so it's a great pleasure to be here. Um, so what I'm going to talk about is, uh, is joint work with Tom Bridgeland. And it's, you can find it on the archive. And just to give you kind of a flavor of what, what I'm going to, to say, just to make sure you've walked into the right place, or maybe not, um, I'm going to, to sort of try to uh, draw a parallel between two, two uh, areas where discontinuities come up. The, the, the first one is, is wall crossing in algebraic geometry. And a little bit more specifically, this refers to the jumps in GIT quotients. In other words, the jumps you observe when you form a GIT quotient, and then you decide to change the, uh, the data that you use to, uh, to form the GIT quotient. So of course, I'll define that uh, when, when we come to it. And another context um, where discontinuities come up is uh, Stokes phenomena. ODs on P1, so on the Riemann sphere, um, and these ODs have to have irregular singularities. Meaning poles of order uh, two or, or higher. And then there's a whole plethora of interesting phenomena which are calling Stokes phenomena, and, and uh, they, these, these solu sol good solutions have changes of asymptotics, and there's jumps in those. And then I'll, so I'll explain what those are, and then I'll, I'll set up a parallel. So let me, let me start then by, by explaining the wall crossing. So the context in which I'm going to, going to work is that of, of an abelian category. Um, and for those yes, who are geometrically minded, you could think, for example, of the uh, category of coherent sheaves on a, on a variety. And then the goal is going to be here to study moduli spaces of semi-stable objects in, in this category. Okay, so semi-stable semi -stable sheaves, for example. Now, there's a big undefined term here, which is semi-stable. Semi so I have, to, I, have to, I have to say what, what, um, what a semi-stable object is. That's not something that's, that's uh, given a priori. So we have to define, we have to give a definition, which is due to Tom Bridgeland. And abstracts what uh, is known to be the right, the, the, a good way, uh, a good definition of semi-stability in contexts like, for example, vector bundles of, over, over curves. So, for, for us, a stability condition on, on A is nothing but a group homomorphism, which are called Z, going from the K group of A to the complex numbers. Okay. So this is the group generated by equivalence classes of, of objects where you decree that modulo uh, short exact sequences. So this is so whenever you have a short exact sequence. And this, so it's not just a group homomorphism, it has to have a certain positivity property, specifically that if I look at the positive cone, so that's, that's the, 
the, the monoid ge generated by the classes of actual as opposed to virtual objects of, on A, then this has to be mapped by this group homomorphism to the upper half plane. Okay. And so having given this, let me let me now explain how one how one calls an object semi-stable. So I need another another little piece of definition. If I take an object in A, I will call it I will define its phase, pi of m to be one over pi times z of sorry, the argument of z of m. Okay. So z of m is point in the upper half plane, so it makes sense to talk about its, its argument, and this is a, its argument is between naught and pi, and I divide it by pi, so I find a number between zero, 0 and 1. Okay. And now, last, last definition, I will say that m is semi-stable if whenever I have an n in m, the the phase of the subobject is smaller or equal to the phase of the uh, the bigger object. Okay. So that's that's my that's my definition. So let me let me give a couple of examples of this. So suppose first that x is a smooth projective curve over the complex number, so a Riemann, a Riemann surface, and let's take A to be the coherent sheaves on, on x, and then I can define z of, of a sheaf or of a vector bundle to be minus the degree of the vector bundle plus i times its rank. Okay. And that's certainly in the upper half plane because here this is uh, uh, positive. And so, and then you can, you can check, you can readily check that, um, well, maybe I can just make a remark that this is related to a quantity that one calls the slope. So the slope of psi is, you, is the... Uh, the degree divided by the rank. So that's that's a slope function that one uses in in, uh, in algebraic geometry, and so of course the uh, the phase of of this object is then minus the cotangent of of the slope. So all that matters here is that it's a monotonous function of the slope, and so you can check that z is semi-stable with respect to this to the z I, I've just defined if if and only if it's sem semi stable it's in the sense of slope or Mumford semi stability in other words this coincides with with this usual notion when one has over over curves okay. and there's a perhaps just a surprising feature here is that when one thinking of slope stability, one usually thinks about just a real number here. And here we're somehow defining stability with the help of two complex numbers because this z takes place in, in the complex numbers. But it will be, and so for now, it's not very, very clear why that's essential, but it will become clear after a while that we really need to work over the complex numbers. So that was kind of a, an example of, more, of a more... Uh, geometric origin. Now let me give an example of more algebraic origin. So let me take A to be the modules over R, but R is a finite dimensional algebra over the complex numbers. Okay, so then, for example, n by n matrices. Um, so then the, the K group of A is nothing but, is the, the free abelian group generated by by the simples. So. Okay. 
And so a stability condition is nothing but, so it has to map each of these to a complex number, and that complex number has to be in the upper half plane. So specifying a stability condition on this abelian category is nothing but taking a point in the n fold product of the of the upper half plane. And now let me give, give the maybe the simplest but still illustrative example of um, of wall crossing here. So let's further specialize this example. Let's take A to be representations of the so-called A2 quiver. So representation of a quiver by definition is uh, the data which where you attach a vector space to each of the of the um, of the vertices, and then you attach you attach a um, an a homomorphism to each to each arrow. Okay. So here we have what are the simple representations here? So simples here are S1, which is C sitting above the vertex one and zero sitting above vertex two. S2, which is zero, C. And then there's, a, there's an interesting non-simple and an indecomposable object, which is, which is a representation that has a vector sp space of dimension one sitting above each of the two points. And then the endomorphism I associate to the arrow here, the homomorphism, sorry, is just multiplication by non-zero, non-zero scalar. Okay, so it's, it's an isomorphism. All right. Um, okay, and so so now I have I have a short exact well I have a short exact sequence like this. So clearly S two, S two yes is a sub representation of of it because that vector space is sitting there. Okay, and so I can draw the following. So to say that I have a stability condition is again to to prescribe two vectors in the upper in the upper half plane. Z S1 and ZS2. And although this representation is not the sum of those two, but it is in, in the K group, so, and, and therefore, Z of V e is here. And I find here that E, in, for this rep, um, stability condition, E is semi stable. Because it has one subobject, which is S2, but the slope or the phase of this subobject is smaller than that and that of E, and therefore E is, is semi-stable. Okay. But I could have taken uh, an opposite choice, so I could have done, I could have, for example, chosen ZS2 here and ZS1 here, in which case Z of E would have come somewhere here. And then in this case, E is not semi-stable because it has a subobject, which is the very same as was before, but now S2 is ahead of, Z of S2 is ahead of Z of, Z of E. So there's, there's, a, there's something that jumps here. There was something that was semi-stable here is not semi-stable anymore. And so there's a jumping locus. which is a set of Zs such that Z of S1 over Z of S2 is a positive real number. Okay. So this defines, this is a, a so-called wall. So it's a, <clears throat> it's a real uh, co-dimension one submanifold of my space of stability condition. Okay, and it is across this wall that there is a jump. In other words, an object which was semi-stable becomes, ceases to be, to be semi-stable. And what we'll be interested in is to exactly understand how the set, or more precisely the variety of semi-stable objects, jumps across, across these walls. So let me, let me say, let me say this more precisely. So let's fix a class in the K group once and for all. 
and then I'm going to associate to it the, um, the set of isomorphism classes of objects in the, in the category. So again, this is isomorphism classes of sheaves or, or isomorphism classes of representations, which are given by M, which are equal to M in the, in the K group, and are also semi-stable with respect to the stability condition here. And then the goal is going to be, is going to be so goal is to understand how this jumps across walls in the space of all stability conditions. Okay. And there's a very similar, uh, there's a very closely related problem in symplectic geometry, which is that when you do the symplectic reduction of a, of a manifold with respect to a certain value of, the, of the, uh, the moment map, whenever you cross walls which co correspond to critical values of the, of the moment map, then, then the symplectic reduction jumps, and that's also known as a, as a, as a, as a wall crossing, and it's cl very closely related to, to this. Okay, so that's, that's going to be our basic... Uh, uh, problem of interest. And now, now there's, um, there's a there's a very interesting, very beautiful algebraic approach to this. So, so WC stands for wall crossing, which is due to, uh, to Reinecke and to later developed uh, by, by Dominic Joyce. And it goes as follows. So we're going to focus for, for technical simplicity to the algebraic category of representations of a finite dimensional algebra. So I'm just going to leave coherent sheaves uh, aside. Okay. And then I'm going to look at M to be the moduli space of objects in, in this abelian of actually isoclasses, isomorphism classes of objects in, in my billion category. So what this looks like, it's, um, I can describe it as the, this joint union over all possible dimensions of a space that parameterizes representations of a given dimension. And so then in that dimension, I find an affine space. So this is the affine space that parameterizes all actions of this algebra on a, on a fixed copy of C to the D. Okay. And then, of course, I have to mod out by the conjugation action by changes of basis, so by the action of GLD. Okay. So this is technically a stack, but it's a global stack, so it's a fairly, it's a fairly friendly object. All right, and now I'm going to want to cut out in this space that, that, sub, that sub, subset there, which I was calling, which I was calling the semi-stable representation. So instead of looking at this, I'm going to replace this by so characteristic function of, so this is a subset here of here of So instead of looking at this, so I'm going to translate sort of geometry into algebra, instead of trying to understand the jumping of this variety here, I'm going to look at its characteristic function. So really it's a delta function supported on that subset. And I'm going to look at how this jumps. And of course that's going to tell me exactly how, how this jumps. Okay. Now this is, this, is an, this is a function. It's a complex valued function on this uh, moduli, moduli space, and specifically it's actually a constructible function. And I'll call the space of all such constructible functions. 
So constructible function, re recall means some, a function which, which has a finite support, okay, like this. So it says, and okay. So a constructible function is a function which has finite, uh, which takes finitely many values and so whose level sets are constructible subsets and a constructible subset is something, uh, it's a something which is in the Boolean algebra generated by things cut out by algebraic equation. So something cut out by an algebraic equation is constructible, its complement is also constructible, finite unions and finite intersections are also constructible. And so you can, you can check that this is actually a constructible function on that. And this function space I will call the whole algebra of, of A. So again, what this is, it's essentially, module this constructible thing, it's the algebra of functions on the space of isomorphism classes of, of objects. And I'm calling it the algebra because it indeed has an interesting product, which one calls the convolution product, which is defined as follows. So given two functions on the space of objects, I define a convolved function, and I have to explain what its value at an object m is. Okay? And I define it by the following. So, so it's, a, it's an integral, in a sense, to be specified. And I'm going to integrate over all, or sum, if you prefer, over all sub-objects of m. And I'm then going to evaluate f at n and g at m over n. And I'm going to do this with respect to a measure which I'm going to call d chi. Sure. What's your relation just now? Ah. <laughs> Was it important? It should look to me like a collection of a Lie group. Uh, a collection or a rotation? No, 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 no. Uh, well, y yes and no. Actually, I should have done this in slow motion. So. Here I had a setup, if I remember correctly, where E was semi-stable. Yeah, right. And then changing the stability condition is, j just means arbitrarily moving those two vectors. So I can, I can move them like this, I can force shrink them and dilate them. And then something was happening when they crossed. Okay, and so that was this jumping locus, which I said that the, when those two vectors become collinear, something happens. And across from that wall, the, the object is not semi-stable so anymore. So rotating one to the other. It's not, well, it's, yes, it's rotating, it's, you have to rotate the, the two so that they become collinear and then pass them. Thank you. That's all. Okay, so, um, okay, so I have to say a few words about what this, um, so this is the integral of constructible functions, so I have to say a few words. Uh, if I were working over a finite field, which I don't want to do, but if I were working over a finite field, this would literally be a sum so that I would be counting uh, points over a finite field, this would really literally be a sum over all subspaces of M. Okay. If over FQ, okay. and in general, integral here, i.e. over C, integral d chi, this means the Euler characteristic, is the push forward, so I have to tell you how to integrate a constructible function. So d chi, is, if this constructible function happens to be the sum a i delta of y i, then this by definition is sum a i or the characteristic of y i. So the way I push forward, or as I said, I integrate along the fibers of, for a constructible function, is that the value on the base is just by taken by taking the Euler characteristic of, of the fiber. Okay. okay, so let me say a couple of uh, simple things about this product. So it has, this is an associative, so is an associative product. And then it has a unit, 
And the unit, as you, you might be able to guess, is the delta function of the zero object. So let's take this definition, which is maybe easier to, to digest. It's clear that if g is the function that only detects the zero object, it only scores when n is equal to, to the whole of m, and then I, it returns f of m. So that's it's a right unit, and like for a re similar reason, you can convince yourself it's a left unit. And then the n product, so if I take n functions and evaluate it on, on object m, well, you can convince yourself that this is an integral in the same sense as before over n step filtrations of m of f1 evaluated on the first factor, dot 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 fn evaluated on the last factor, and then again, or with respect to the uh, Euler characteristic, push forward. All right, so <coughs> so we strayed a little bit from more crossing, and we, we'll continue to stray for another few minutes. For now, I'm just developing a calculus, if you will. So we wanted to study this. We decided to, instead of studying it, we're going to study its characteristic function. And now we've put in this characteristic function in some function space on which we're studying, of which we're studying some calculus. So we have some integral and product and so on and so forth. And now, now in a little while, I'm going to return to the, to, the, to the original problem. But let me tell you, let me give you first an example to see what sort of uh, function space, spaces come out of this. And this is an example due to, to Ringel over a finite field and then re-elaborated by Schofield and Riedmann. And the example is the following, that is that if I take A to be the representations of a quiver of Q, so Q, a Dinkin quiver, say a finite Dinkin quiver. Okay, so I was explaining earlier what it means to take representations of, a, of, a, of an oriented graph. And now for oriented graph, I'm going to insist that I take the Dinkin diagram of a semi-simple Lie algebra, for example. Well, this was this corresponded to the Lie algebra SL3. And in general, Q will correspond to a semi-simple Lie algebra G. And this Lie algebra, just like SL3, has a decomposition to a negative part, a diagonal part, and, and a positive part. And then the theorem here is that this algebra, which you get, this whole algebra, turns out to be isomorphic to the enveloping algebra of the positive part. So it's the enveloping algebra for SLN of, of, of upper triangular, triangular matrices. All right. Now one la last piece of, um, in, so in general, yes, let me just say, in general, this is not an accident. So in general, you always get that this whole algebra is always isomorphic to the enveloping algebra of n, where n is some pro nilpotent Lie algebra. So this is this is not an this is not an accident. Okay. <coughs> Oh uh, well, that's a, that's a very good question. Definitely in both both ways, <coughs> as any as any serious isomorphism. Yeah, so um, one way one way is that see this this algebra. Uh, it's particularly true if you do it over a finite field. This algebra has canonical bases, uh, canonical bases, namely the characteristic function of object of, of objects. This does not actually. So by reading it like that, this gives you an interesting basis of this of this algebra. The other way. Yes. Yeah. Right. 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 No. 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 It's a very. It's a very concrete. It's a very concrete isomorphism. Yes. You detect the generators, and then I mean, we take some. 
And the other way around, it's sort of embedded in, in this, that um, the Euler characteristics of, of moduli spaces of objects in, in, in your category become structure constants for the algebra. Okay. And so if you know the algebra, then you can, if you, if you know it very well, then you can read Euler characteristics of moduli, moduli spaces of objects in, in here. So it really, it really goes both ways. All right. So let me let me then persist along this uh, sort of algebraic algebraic path and tell tell you something about how to narrow Simon filtrations. And again, this is a, this is going to be an abstraction of something that's that's well known and, and uh, used very much used uh, uh, when studying vector bundles over over curves. So this is the statement that for any for any object M there exists a unique filtration starting say, at zero which has the property that the factors are semi-stable and two that their slopes are strictly decreasing. So you can show you can show inductively that such a thing um, exists, and and then that it's unique. And now let me g give you a reformulation of this, due to Reinecke, which justifies perhaps I mean uh, the the relevance of the of the product. And so it's the following. So we're going to do something which will seem a little bit odd at first. So I'm going to fix array in the, in the complex plane. And I'm going to define then the following. I'm going to define an element of the whole algebra. So it's going to be some function uh, for, for given corresponding to this ray. And the value of this function on an object m is going to be the following. So it's going to be 1 if m is uh, semi-stable, sorry, yes, semi-stable and uh, z of m is in L. Okay. So remember, Yes, z of m was, was a, yes, a complex number. It's in, it's in the upper half plane. And this goes 1 if m is semi-stable and this complex number lands on, on the given ray. And 0 otherwise. Okay. So in terms of things we've already seen, this s of l is equal to the function that detects the uh, 0 object, what I was calling the unit, plus a sum over all alpha such that z alpha is in M. So I'm summing over all uh, points in the, in the K group of delta alpha Z. Okay, I should put maybe a superscript Z here. Yes. Okay. Since this was the function that detects semi-stable objects of charge or of image in K, in K group alpha. Okay, and then One final bit of notation is going to define a very easy function. I might have started by defining this. And this is going to be the function that's 1 everywhere. Okay, so that one's easy to understand. And it's not to be confused again with the multiplicative unit, which you remember, I just erased it, is the delta function of the zero object. So this one only detects a zero object. This one detects absolutely every single object. And then the very beautiful proposition of Reinecke says that the harder narrow Seaman property implies the following, the following very pretty identity, which is that if I take the following clockwise product, so I consider all these elements and I multiply them according to the convolution product. So that, so each corresponds to ray, 
And I put those that correspond to array, well, I, I multiply clockwise, so I sort of read things from left to right. And then out comes this. Okay. So this is this is Reinecke's reformulation, and I might leave this as a as a homework, but just I'll give a I'll give a hint. So um, the the left hand side, I'm just going to use I'm just going to use this expression here. Okay. By by this this is one plus. So how do you multiply? This is an infinite product of things which are one plus something, one plus something, one plus. So then. I'm going to sum over n, and n is a number of non-trivial somethings that I take in each factor. And then in each I take an element in the k group. And then this ordering means that I have to take, be such that the phase of the first, that the phases are strictly decreasing like that. And then it's delta alpha 1 z convoluted dot 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 delta alpha n z. And then you have to remember what I erased five minutes ago, which was the defining property of, well, what defines the n product, which was it was an integral in this order sense over all step, n step filtrations. And so if you evaluate this on, on, on an object, it's going to look for this particular monomial, it's going to look for n step filtrations, but because of the definition of these functions, it wants that all the, the factors are. Uh, semi-stable, and because of this condition, it wants that the phases be decreasing. So in other words, because the hardener semen filtration exists and it's unique, this thing is going to score one on every object. It's going to score one exactly when it finds the hardener semen filtration, and the right-hand side, of course, scores one no matter what you feed it, so one is equal to one. All right. And so this implies, and this would be, I mean, this would take a little bit of time to explain, but this implies by the work of, of, of Reinecke and Joyce that you can find formulas for the delta functions corresponding to a new stability condition as a function, as an explicit. function of the delta functions corresponding to, an old, to, to, a, to a different stability condition. And in two words, but I mean it would take some time to explain this, but the point is that this relation, I can write it like this, for any, so this is independent of the stability condition, this is a boring function, and so I can read that this is equal to that is equal to that for, for, for this one. And if I can invert one of these relations, so from this I can read the deltas, as we just saw, and if I can invert them, I can, I can read those deltas in terms of these other deltas. So that's, that's the, the idea. And this can be done, and this is the work of Reinecke, this can be done very, very explicitly. Okay, now armed with this uh, explicit but uh, here unrevealed knowledge, Joyce set out to do the following thing. So he, 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 tried, he, he packaged these, um, these delta functions into the following, the following thing. So you have to bear with me for a So what did Joyce do? So he, so we have these delta functions, and these delta functions, as I sort of hand waved in the case of the of the quiver with two vertices, when you when you move your stability condition, so when you move the two rays, typically don't change, don't don't change if you move it a little bit, and at some stage you, you hit a wall and then they, they they abruptly have a discontinuous jump. So they're they're piecewise constant function, but uh, but globally discontinuous. And so Joyce. Try to do the following. He said, I'm going to tr 
bunch together all these functions to this enormous generating function. Okay. So I'm going to, to, to make a sum over all n, a sum over all n tuples of elements in the k group that sum to alpha. And then I'm going to take this convolution product and I'm going to weigh it with some ansatz function for now, which is just And then I'm going to require something. So the, requ the something I'm going to require is the following. So each of these constituents is discontinuous. So obviously the product is, is going, what we expect it to be discontinuous. And the question is, can we cancel these discontinuities by some scalar valued function? And so can we cook up some suitable function j so that this whole thing becomes continuous? And um, and the theorem is that you can do this. So, so he shows that there exist essentially unique functions Jn, which are holomorphic with cuts. So they, they, they jump, like the log, such that the f alpha here defined is a continuous function from the space of stability conditions to the whole algebra, which is, in addition, holomorphic. With no, with no cuts. And yeah, but it's easy to, well, it's not easy, but you, you can convince yourself once you have the f off, you can reconstruct these, these invariants. So he, ex he explains how you can concretely, sort of, fairly concretely, cancel all these discontinuities into a holomorphic function. And second, the, this is not an ad hoc construction, so the, J, the Jn's are independent of the abelian category you use. So this is not something you do category by category. These are universal functions that correct these discontinuities. And third, armed with these functions, you form this generating function, and you find the following very puzzling PD, which is that these functions, they satisfy, so they satisfy as functions of Z, they satisfy this nonlinear partial differential equation, which is fairly simple to write, and it seems like it's fallen on completely out of the out of, out of the blue. And so where, so where Tom and I, well, where Tom and I started collaborating together is by, 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 by making the observation that, uh, that this, of, this PD governs isomonodromic deformations. But before that, I mean, the, I think the, the, the question was to understand exactly. So Joyce's construction is, uh, is extremely de detailed, but it sort of begs the question of what exactly is being constructed here. I mean, he sort of asks a fairly natural question, a fairly natural question, pack these, package these things into a continuous and holomorphic generating function, but it's not really clear why he finds a solution and what, what the solution really means. And so, so we were trying to understand this, and then, but then we realized that that this PD appears in a completely different context, so that of isomonodromic deformations, and thinking about that actually does give an answer to what this construction means. So that's what I would like to try to, to explain. Okay, so now I'm going, to, I'm going to jump rather discontinuously to a different context, so the context where these isomonodromic deformations arise. And so I'm going to tell you about Stokes factors. So we're going to take uh, a tour of, of ODs on P1. We're going to leave this aside for, for some time, and then I'll, I'll come back and, and revisit these results through, through, through the, the lens of Stokes factors. So, so here what we're going to do is we're going to fix an algebraic group, and then in it a maximal torus. Okay, and the example you should keep in mind is the group of n by n matrices 
inside which I'm going to take the group of invertible diagonal matrices. And then I'm going to decompose the Lie algebra, so of G, as the diagonal matrices plus the sum of the root spaces. Okay, so these would be the, the elementary matrices in the case of, of GLN. And what I'm going to look at is a G connection on the Riemann sphere of the form nabla is equal to D minus Z over T squared plus F over T DT. So T is, a, is my coordinate on, on P1. And so let, let me, let's, so, let, so let's digest this a little bit. So, so this is a connection which has a pole of order 2 at the origin. So pole 2 at 0. And I'm going to assume that the residue, the 2 residue, Z, is, lies in this uh, Cartan subalgebra, so it's a diagonalizable matrix. And in fact, I'm going to assume it's, it has distinct eigenvalues. So, okay. And the second assumption I'm going to make is, I mean, is to notice first that this has a pole of order 1 at infinity, the residue being minus f, and I'm going to assume this f is off-diagonal. So I'm going to assume that it doesn't have a component along that. That's not really essential, but it just makes life and formulas a little bit easier. And, yeah, this is good. And now what I, what I want to do is, so aim in this in this game is to find good fundamental solutions of this connection or differential, differential equation. Now, just as a warm-up, let's suppose that f is equal to 0. Okay. Then a solution is then just given by e to the minus z over, over t. Now, if f is not equal to 0, then I could try to look for a solution, sort of for a perturbation of, of this. So I could try, as an ansatz, I could try the following thing, where in the first instance, I look for a formal solution. So I'm going to look for this of the form okay, as, you, as, you, as you would do for, a, for an ODE. And so what this takes values in is in the formal power series with values in the, in, the, in, the, um, in the group. And the little proposition, which is, which is fun, to, fun to prove, is that such an f, such a formal f, exists, always exists, and, and is unique. Okay, so you, you plug it into the differential equation like that, and then you, this gives a, an iterative equation, and then you see that you can you can solve it. Okay, and now, but the important, I mean, okay, that's important, but the, the, the other important thing is that in general, the radius of convergence of f is, is zero. So that's what the, 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 the critical the, the difference between Fuchsian equations, so equations which have a pole of order one, and irregular equations is that, that in the Fuchsian case, formal solutions always converge. And here, on the other hand, there's a, there's a discrepancy between the, the algebra and the, and the analysis. 
So we have to we have to revise our goals to a more modest ones. And what we what so I have let, let me introduce a little definition. Oh, now I, I finished the good shop, it seems. <laughs> um, so let me define the Stokes rays of this connection as a rays. Uh, so Z alpha. So Z is a semi-simple matrix. Uh, it acts, it acts on each of these root spaces as a scalar. The scalar is given by a pairing of the linear form alpha on Z, which I'm writing as Z alpha. Okay. So these, these are what we're seeing here are all the, all the eigenvalues of the matrix, or the non-zero eigenvalues of the matrix Z in the adjoint representation. And I'm taking, I'm just taking the rays through these. So e.g., if Z were a n by n matrix with distinct eigenvalues, then the rays would be the rays through the difference of the eigenvalues, since, okay, since these are the eigenvalues of Z in the adjoint representation. OK. And now we have, let me, well, okay, let me another piece of, introduce another piece of notation. If I take a ray in the complex plane, I'm going to denote the upper half plane, which is orthogonal to it by the open one, by HR. And the basic theorem is that if R is not a Stokes ray, so one of these finitely many rays to the difference of the eigenvalues, then there exists a unique solution phi r defined on this half plane hr with values in g, which is holomorphic, a fundamental solution such that, which has the correct asymptotic, so that phi r times e to the z over t tends to 1 in hr as t tends to 0. Okay. And so there's many ways to, to do this. I mean, one way to, that people do it is that they start from, the, uh, from this for, formal fundamental solution. And then they do a resummation. Did I? No. They do a, a resummation of it in these, in these half planes using uh, a suitable method, method of summation. In this case, for the very special equation that I, that I did here, you can, you can get away with, with a simple Laplace transform, which is actually the simplest kind of, of resummation there, there is. I'm sorry, just yeah. because it wouldn't be so bad. The light is still on. Uh, I th might not be. Is it green? Yeah. OK, it is. OK. All right. Yeah, because it was a change in my. Okay, so okay, so now we have these. So we, see, in other words, these formal fundamental solutions can be made to be convergent on half planes. And now we're going to ask the following question: We're going to take two rays, which, and then so e, one determines a half plane, and the other one determines another half plane, and these overlap on on that wedge. And then we're going to compare the solution phi r to the solution corresponding to the fire prime, and ask, are they the same or not? Well, of course, they come from a first order linear differential equation, so they must differ by a constant, meaning a constant element of, of the group. OK, and we have, and I'll, I'll index it by the little wedge, and I have the obvious little factorization property, which that if I, let me see if I order these questions. If I split my wedge in two, then, sorry, this is supposed to happen on the overlap. It's not sorry. Yes, sorry, sorry. Yes, yeah, 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 yes. Right, you're absolutely right. So this, yes, the, the overlap is this. OK. Now, for reasons that are going to become uh, clear in a second, I'm deciding to give a name to the wedge that's, that's yes, which, as you uh, say, is absolutely not the overlap of the two, the two half planes. Okay. 
but yes, the sigma I want is really, so let's give it a name and a color, is the sigma here, okay? And, um, and I claim that if I split the sigma in two, then it should be clear that S sigma is equal to S sigma one times S sigma two. Okay. This is just because you can do analytic continuation in, in stages. I mean, I can, I have now three hyperplanes and I can, I, three planes and I can just jump from one. Okay. And now we have the following useful proposition. So the proposition is the following. So this allows me, by the way, the, 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 I'm, I'm putting this on the board because it allows me to concentrate on smaller wedges. And the proposition is the first. So first of all, if sigma does not contain Stokes rays, then this constant is equal to 1. In other words, changes of asymptotics occur only when we cross Stokes rates. And the second statement is that if sigma contains Stokes rays, but by this factorization property I can chop it up so that it contains only one, to make my life simpler, contains on a Stokes ray L, then we have, then I'll say this kind of, SL lives, so S sigma, which I'll rename as SL, lives on L. And by this I mean the following. No, they feel different. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. All right, well. um, so in the following sense, that first of all, SL has a log, so it's the exponential of something like this, okay, and then this something lies in the, in the span of the eigenspaces for Z corresponding to eigenvalues lying on Z, on, on the line L. Okay. All right, and this is this SL So SL is then called a Stokes factor. And the collection of those, okay, we'll think of as the monodromy of this irregular connection. And it's a, it's a correct way of thinking in the sense that this, the, the, these uh, these elements allow you to reconstruct the gauge uh, equivalence class of the connection. So they capture the connection completely. Okay, now let me, let me talk about another system of invariance, another set of invariance, which are very similar. So I'm going to take mm -hmm. how, many, how many crates of this do you have? There's a bad spot in it. Okay, this is getting better. So let me take R not Stokes. Okay. And let me take you have to have smaller, better chart. Yes. Thank you very much. Yeah, they're really much better. So so I have R not Stokes. And then what I'm going to do is take the R, ah, yes. Take the fundamental solution corresponding to R. And now I can do I can do two things. I can I can I will not so it's defined. It starts life as being defined on this half plane here. And then I can, I can continue it to the other half plane in two ways. I can go up and I can, I can go down. Here I have to make a choice because these things don't overlap. And let me call these two choices by five plus and minus. And then what I will, I, I express my answers as, as what is sitting at the other end, so phi of minus r times a constant which I'll call s plus or s minus. Okay, and this by definition, these are, so these are also elements of G, they're constants, and they're called Stokes matrices or multipliers.
And just because you can do uh, analytic continuation in stages, as I was saying earlier, you have the identity. Oh. Uh, yes, this jumps. Jumps, yes, that's right. It's, it's very excited. So call this. So I'm, I'm going to call this orange plane H. And I claim that the analytic continuation from here to here, because you can do it in stages and crossing one Stokes ray at a time, is, ex is expressed as a clockwise product of all the Stokes factors which land in here. And for the same reason, the, the other one is equal to L in the opposite of SL inverse. And so what I've just explained is that you can go from SL to, to the Stokes matrices, but you can also show that you can, you can go back. So those two things are, are equivalent notions of monodromy. I think I'm already over time, right? Yes, grossly, in fact. No, no, not grossly. I think no. you started with 10 minutes late. So. Ah, OK. So I'm five. OK. So I'm going to need another. Five minutes from being grossly over time. Okay. All right. So I'm probably going to need 10 more minutes. OK, so all right, so let me conclude this by, by talking about, a little bit about isomonodromy. So if you believe that the correct notion of monodromy for these irregular connections is that of the Stokes factors, or equivalently that of the Stokes matrices here, you can pose the following question. So you want to vary z, z in h reg. Okay, so you want to change the eigenvalues of z while keeping them distinct from each other. And you want the monodromy not to change. And so, so as z varies, the following are equivalent. So this is a theorem of Miwa, Jimbo, Bueno, and Volch, so this is for GLN and this is for G reductive. And the th th theorem follows, says the following. One is that the Stokes factors are constant. Sorry, the Stokes matrices are constant. Okay. So the monodromy doesn't move. And the other is that, so obviously if you want things to change, if you want things to remain constant since Z is changing, sort of will be willing to believe that f has to change somehow to counter the change of z. And so an equivalent way of saying that is that f is a holomorphic function of z satisfying df alpha. So I'm, I'm going to write an equation for each of the components of f is equal to 1 half sum beta plus gamma is equal to alpha f beta f gamma d log beta over gamma, which was the equation we saw, we saw before. Just as we saw before, this identity, which was then, which was then explained as the, the algebraic reformulation of the hardener Siemens property. Okay. All right, and so what I would like to, to conclude by explaining is that, so we're now, we're now seeing some things which at the very least look like notational co coincidences between wall crossing and, and Stokes phenomena. And I would like to explain that these are actually two, that the things we observe in wall crossing are actually an instance of Stokes phenomena. They don't just look like it. So let, me, let us go back to the initial context, which was the representation category of a finite dimensional algebra. We had a whole algebra H. And I, I remember I told you that this always looks like the enveloping algebra of an ill-potently algebra. And so to it is associated, or pro-nilpotently algebra to be more precise. So to it is associated a pro-unipotent group. Now on this Lie algebra, I didn't really particularly insist upon that, but this is graded by the K group. So there's an action of okay. 
because this Lie algebra decomposes as the function supported on each k group class. And so, and so this, is, this is, a, is a torus, is an algebraic torus. And so I'm going to take G to be the group, the semi-direct product of this torus by this pro omnipotent group. Okay, so this is a, in general, so for a finite quiver, for a finite quiver, this is going to be the upper triangular matrices. And for a general abelian category, this is going to be a fairly big, big uh, group. Okay, so that's my first, my first choice. Then I'm going to take Z to be a stability condition on the abelian category. And you remember this was a homomorphism from the K group to the complex numbers with a certain positivity property. But now this vector space I see is actually the Lie algebra of this torus, okay? And I'm going to call this Lie algebra Gothic H. So I have a semi-simple element here. And then I'm going to pick an, an F in, in this Lie algebra, but in the nilpotent part of, of the Lie algebra. And this is under this grading action, this decomposes as the sum of these root components, like that. And then the, the following holds. So the following, so it says the following, so that the, fo the following are equivalent conditions on the connection, on the G connection, nabla is equal to D minus Z over T squared plus F over T. So for reasons to become clear in a, in a minute, I decide now to, to plug, to think of this stability condition as a diagonal matrix, and I plug it into the most singular part of the connection of the kind that we were looking at, and then this, this element, I, I, put it, I put it here. Okay. And now the first, the first statement is the statement that we, we had set out to, uh, to try to understand, which is that F alpha is given by this Joyce expression. So the first statement is, was this mysterious statement, namely that f is given by this complicated generating, generating function with j other functions that Joyce defines. The second, and so this particular, in particular, this statement has absolutely nothing to do with the fact that I plugged f into, into a differential equation. The second statement is that the Stokes factor of this connection here corresponding to the ray, so the Stokes factor SL corresponding to the ray L in the upper half plane is the characteristic function SL of semi-stable objects. Um, M such that ZM lies in M. So you remember in reformulating, in giving Reinecke's reformulation of the hardener Seaman property, I had introduced those generating functions for objects, semi-stable objects living on a, on a ray. So that's what I had called that bold SL. And now we're saying that I can, I can try to think of these as, as Stokes factors of a connection of this form. And this theorem is saying two things. Saying, first, it's saying that you can, so yes, you can, meaning that uh, you, there's a sort of Riemann-Hilbert problem you can solve. In other words, you can specify the monodromy data in the shape of these SLs. And it says 
you can indeed find a connection on this form which realizes that monodromy data. So embedded in here is the solution to that. Not only that, but it's saying that you can so do so in, in an explicit and constructive manner. Specifically, the f you need to plug in here to get to, to, to produce those correct Stokes factors is exactly the f that Joyce produces. So in other words, you then have a slightly a more conceptual explanation which says the f is designed so that the Stokes factors are, are like that. And there's an even simpler, perhaps, characterization, an equivalent one, is that the Stokes multipliers of this very same connection uh, are S plus was that function, remember, which was one on every single, on every single uh, object, and S minus is equal to this multiplicative unit. So this was a delta function supported just on the and so in other words, the, the conceptual way of saying I take f to be that is to say, well, I'm just going to take the unique connection whose Stokes factors are these two, Stokes multipliers, I'm sorry, are these two things which are canonically given by the abelian category. And in particular, as z varies, this connection here varies isomonodromically. And why is that? Well, you can see it from here. I'm listing the two Stokes factors here, you know, each Stokes multipliers, sorry, in a way which is clearly independent of z. There's no mention of z here or there. So then I have not only a connection, but an isomolodromic family of connections as z varies. And therefore, it follows by this theorem uh, that I erased, this miwa jimbo Bueno theorem, that df alpha is equal to 1 half sum beta plus gamma is equal to alpha f beta f gamma d log beta over gamma. So now, well, this is a differential equation that, that uh, Joyce had derived, but now it doesn't fall from the sky anymore. Oh, it's it, it, it's, it's an, an equivalent way of saying that you have an isomonodromic family of, of connection. Okay, now I am grossly, grossly over time, so I'm going to stop here. Thank you for your patience. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Other questions? Uh, what, they're in no hurry for us across the street. No, Some of you may be in a hurry to leave, but uh, Thank you. We, have, we have time for questions. Certainly the cameras aren't about to run out of film, of uh, space. <coughs> Are there questions? I, I actually have some. Sure. I thought maybe somebody else had some. So of course, you always try to relate <coughs> new stuff you don't know to stuff you do know. Right. And with all the constructible stuff at the beginning, in the positivity conditions, I was kind of struck by, well, first how much it felt like McPherson's discussion when he's doing term classes of, right, right. of yeah, that you know, calculus, singular spaces, that same calculus, that calculus is there. Right, that, that comes from that. Yeah, that calculus is there. But in a very real sense, the perverse sheaves correspond to things where you have kind of positivity in the Euler characteristics of the strata for the normal Morse data, which kind of seems like a stability to, you know, it's get something positive. And then of course there's perverse sheaves that are, are equivalent to the category of, of uh, holonomic D modules with mm -hmm. regular singularities. And then these are irregular singularities. I'm just wondering if there's a bigger connection here. Right. And when you were talking about the, uh, your S sub L of M, I, I made a note to myself to look at your Shurman's notes on where he pretty much redoes a lot of nearby cycle, vanishing cycle stuff in the, in the, in the sense of just constructible functions. And I don't write a S sub L of M, it looks just like a nearby cycle, a constructible nearby cycle functor. Okay, so what, I'm just, does any of that relate to any of this other than, yeah, they both use constructible functions in any way that you know. Uh, well, okay, so <laughs> answer this in less than five words. So, um, well, so, so, the, the point is here that differential equations are happening on a different space. So if we think, if we think of constructible function, functions, as, as I was doing, those are constructible functions on, on a certain moduli space of representations or, or objects of an abelian category. Okay? So, so they, they, you, you could think of these indeed if you want as regular holonomic D modules on that moduli space. Um, right. Yeah, well, the analog is to give yourself kind of a, a, a graph where the strata correspond to the nodes and the 
and the lines connecting them correspond to the adjacency relationships in the strata, and that's how you would assign. The modules you assign would be the Morse modules of the... No, no, but the particular constructible functions I was looking at, yeah. they are defined on something which is well, It's not exactly a, uh, a scheme, but okay, but, it, but it's, it's that stack of all representation. So that's where yeah. the DD modules would live. And that's where they would have uh, sim well, oh. logarithmic sing singularity. Right. Okay. Yeah. Now, slightly elsewhere, I, 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 I decided for some reason to study the space of stability condition on my abelian category, which in a sense doesn't have, the, the space of stability condition doesn't have anything to do with the moduli space. So it, I mean, it does because they come from the same category, but one is this, so, yeah, no. okay, one is this uh, rep D yeah. okay, over GLD and union of, of those. So that's, that's on the thing on which constructible functions live. And then the space on which, the space that parameterizes is, space, is a space of stability condition, which is in this simple case, is just the product of upper half planes. Okay. And here, okay, so this is a second space. And then the third space is this somewhat artificial P1 that I introduced, kind of out of a, out of a hat, mm -hmm. on which I'm looking at differential equations with higher order thoughts. And that's where I have the, my irregular singularity and my Stokes phenomena. The Stokes phenomena are valued in something, right. in a Lie algebra, which is constructed out of right. constructible things yes. living on here. Yes. Yeah. But it's, not, it's definitely not the yeah. same space. Where, I mean, no, no. right, they're not living on the same. Yeah, I'm still trying to build the, uh -huh. the connection with things I understand well in my mind, but yeah, okay. Yeah.